Well, welcome everybody to Local Foods College. This is our sixth year with the goal of supporting farmers and gardeners and ultimately helping to really foster vibrant local food systems across Minnesota. Um, the webinar series comes to you from University of Minnesota Extension and Linda Kingery with the Northwest uh, Sustainable Development Partnership is the founder and lead organizer for our team and our, the rest of our team consists of several University of Minnesota Extension colleagues from across the state. And and without further ado, Shirley Nordrum, a University of Minnesota Extension educator, also with Leech Lake Tribal College, um, is a, 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 our, our resident expert on seed saving and will be talking with us tonight about some of the really exciting seed saving initiatives happening in Minnesota. Okay, so I think you already all know that I'm Shirley Nordrum. I'm an educator for primarily the Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe, but I also work with Red Lake and White Earth and other Northern Minnesota Ojibwe tribes. And for the last four, well actually six years, but really the last four, we've been really focusing on um, indigenous foods. And so this took me on a journey that I had not really been on before. I've always been a hunter and a gatherer. Um, my parents are big time berry pickers. But when I started um, being brought into the conversations about diet and access to food and things like that, I started wondering, well, how did we get here? I mean, our ancestors lived on this land that was rich with food and we were very healthy people. And, uh, you know, we didn't really have this problem. I started thinking about it and I just thought I'd share this beautiful collection of uh, photos. Um, these are all folks from the Leech Lake area. Um, Rising, uh, the old lady in the corner there is is cutting up uh, squash and picking berries in Little Fork um, and all their corn and all that beauty. So how did how did we come to lose all of our, our foods? Well, as I started studying foods, um, indigenous foods, I learned that, you know, 70% of the world's food supply came from indigenous agriculture, primarily the in, from the Americas. So all the potatoes, tomatoes, peppers, um, corn, squash, beans, avocados, sweet potatoes, cranberries, maple syrup, peanuts, cashews, hazelnuts, and wild rice, can't forget the wild rice, um, were all, you know, foods that we had been eating for, um, you know, centuries, thousands of years. And uh, again, wondering how did we not have access to those foods uh, to keep us healthy. So as I began researching, um, I came upon this terminology called nutricide. And it was uh, coined by an, an anthropologist that was helping some uh, First Nations people with trying to understand their diet and, and their problems. And uh, there's two, two forms of nutricide, and one is the intentional causing or bringing about death uh, from, of a large number of people through nutritional manipulation. And if you think about this for a minute, um, you know, and think about the buffalo, thousands, you know, millions, millions of buffalo were slaughtered um, and that was a key uh, food source as well as providing shelter and clothing for pretty much all of the Plains nations and that caused a lot of problems. And uh, nutricide also includes the intentional causing or bringing about the death of a large body of knowledge concerning food. And what happened here is the boarding schools. So our people always knew how to take care of themselves. They lived in the moment at the time with the land, on the land, and the gifts that were given to us. And there was this time and this period in both the Canadian and the American uh, government systems where um, Native children were taken from their families, um, some of them as babies, but generally around the age of four, and they were taken far away to boarding schools. And so there wasn't that intergenerational knowledge of passing on um, how to grow food, how to harvest food, how to preserve food. Um, my mom and my grandma were uh, survivors of boarding school and they talked about, you know, they did tend gardens, but they never got to eat any of that food. Mostly they were fed uh, things like cornmeal mush and, and porridge and things like that. They weren't fed good meals and they didn't get to cook alongside their parents and they didn't get to hunt alongside their parents. So there was this um, this loss of knowledge. 
So we identified this as an issue in our community that, you know, some people were able to keep some knowledge. And so those skills are still within our communities, but we were working on how to tap them and how to pass that on to others. So it became common knowledge again. The food itself uh, has changed for everyone. In the early 1900s, um, you know, there were hundreds of varieties of different vegetables that we grow in our gardens. Take, for instance, the corn. In here, the slide that I'm presenting to you, it says there were um, 307 varieties of corn in uh, 1903, but, you know, 80 years later, it's common that only 12 varieties are grown. Well, I, I know that this slide is wrong when it comes to corn because um, Native nations had about seven to 8,000 varieties of corn. And um, right here in the Great Lakes, all the Great Lakes tribes had their own um, corns and there was about 84 varieties of Great Lake corn, uh, corn varieties. So over time, we've lost this diversity in our food and, and that's a danger. Um, for a lot of reasons. If you get um, some kind of a pest or some kind of a disease that can come in, when you start having monoculture, um, that can be a great problem. So the loss of diversity uh, of food is, is an issue for all of us. So, you know, we kind of started out easy here at Leech Lake. Uh, Leech Lake had a variety of corn called, um, I think in, if you look, try to research it, you know, from a, um, a seed catalog variety or any museum, they call it um, Bear Island Chippewa Flint. Um, we don't use that term Chippewa, that's an incorrect pronunciation of Ojibwe. So um, we just call it Bear Island Flint. And so we, I went in search of Bear Island Flint seeds from here. I started asking all the people, do you have the Flint, um, do you have the Bear Island Flint? And um, finally, I found a woman in Anigam who had about 25 seeds. And I grew those, um, those seeds out. About 18 of them germinated. And from there, I, um, I grew out the Bear Island Flint. I've now got about, this year, we got about probably eight pounds of seed that we can give to people. And that's what we're growing here. We're just focusing on that, that one corn for right now. But there are the flower, the um, flower corns, flint corns, dent corns, and popcorns. Mostly what's planted around now is just a, a yellow corn or a, a sweet corn, the, the yellow field corn to feed uh, cattle and sheep and things like that, and, and uh, sweet corn, which is really not the type of sweet corn that uh, we had back in the day. Back in the day, our, our corns, our dent corns were the sweetest. And they were probably about maybe five to ten percent, um, you know, of sugars. And now the corns, the sweet corns, even have the super sweets that are about eighty percent uh, sugars. So there's really been a change in how healthy that uh, the corn is for you. We didn't eat it um, as much as just a raw corn. We made a lot of um, cornmeal. We made a lot of hominy and things like that with our corn. So um, the next step, in addition to um, you know growing out your corn, is teaching people how to grow the corn. And here we got some uh, kids in our community that we were planting our, our barrel in the garden. And you got to teach people how to save the seeds. This is an elder from Red Lake who's been uh, growing the Red Lake Flint corn for about 40 years, and it was passed on to him by his uh, his uh, great great uncle. And um, he's showing people how to pick the best seed. Right where he has his hand is generally the portion of the corn that um, produces the biggest and the best seed, and that's uh, the seed that uh, is, is saved for next year's planting. This is a friend of mine, Rowan White. She is um, like probably the best seed saver I know. Uh, she's a Haudenosaunee, Mohawk Haudenosaunee from, um, I think she's from um, a tribe in New York, but she actually lives in California. And she just, you know, they have such a long growing season out there that she has a large 
variety of uh, seeds that she saves and keeps. And here she is um, braiding up of some, uh, I really don't know what she's braiding right there. I can't think what that variety is called, but it's a blue corn, a nice flower corn. It turns out some nice flower. Once it's all braided up, that's, that's still how we braid, and we have big braiding parties this fall. And we braid it up, and then we uh, hang it hang it to dry until it's uh, time to um, take the seed off and put it in a different container. This is some um, Saskatchewan white that was grown out over at White Earth. When we had a big braiding party. Um, but you can see a few, uh, there's some pink-looking uh, cobs in there. That's called Pink Lady. Uh, uh, that is a is a flint corn. The the white is a is a flower corn. So you got some mixture in there. It was a lot of fun when you have these braiding parties. Um, but it's not just enough to show people how to grow and to preserve. You also have to show people how to cook with the corn. And a lot of people just eat sweet corn on the cob now, or you know it's they get it in a can and throw it in a hot dish or whatever. Um, most often, if we weren't making corn flour or making a flour for some type of bread, we made hominy. And uh, we had a big workshop where we taught folks how to make the hominy. There's a couple different ways that you can make it. The traditional way is using ash, um, a lye ash. So you want a, a, the ash from a, um, a hardwood. Well, maple is good, um, oak, some kind of hardwood. and you use the ash from that and you soak the corn for, I usually soak it overnight. I have other friends that don't soak it that long, but after you soak it overnight, that hard um, shell comes off and then you just have the starches of the corn inside and that uh, those starches are easily digestible. You know, most of us know when you eat corn, it really isn't that easily digestible. But once you take that hard outer uh, shell off and you just have the starches, um, it's readily available, all the nutrients in there are readily, readily available um, for your body to use. And that's what we're doing here. Um, and then the cool thing about the food revitalization is, is that most of the things that we did, our baskets and the things that we made were functional. They weren't just art. And oftentimes now um, they're looked upon as art. But um, so you get to revitalize some traditional uh, uh, crafts as well and this is a um, after you soak the corn in the lye and you get that uh, hull off you want to wash the corn and get all the lye off of it so back in the day we made these corn washing baskets and this is woven from nettle uh, when you strip nettle apart you can get a cordage um, a lot like uh, twine or something like that and you make the twine and then you can weave these corn washing baskets and uh, just thought I'd share that with you, that there's a lot more to um, the food thing than just, you know, growing, eating, and preserving. There's some revitalization of some other crafts and things as well. We also uh, made a, what's called a butanagan. Um, the picture on, I'm guessing it's your uh, left, is um, usually use a, a yellow birch tree and you cut that down to about knee height and then you carve out the, a little hole in the middle of it and then you start burning it and what what that does is it ends up making something like a mortar and pestle only it's a lot larger and that's what the youth on the right is using is um, that whole thing is made out of um, yellow birch and that's a, a piece of smoked tanned hide um, covering the top of it so that as you're pounding your corn on, um, you're not losing little pieces of it flying out. The the, the um, buckskin is, is keeping those, those kernels inside there while you pound it out and you can uh, make your flowers and your corn meals and things like that with that butanagan. Um, some, some tribal butanagans are a lot bigger than that, but um, the Ojibwe style is that is that smaller kind. Um, we think that's because we traveled a lot by water and in our canoes that was a manageable size tool to carry with us as we traveled from camp to camp with our corn. So we've been doing some of that as well. 
in addition to teaching people the the tools, um, you know, sometimes you have to have some some cooking classes and teach people how to to, to do some other things with their food. So we've been working with the corn, and we've also been working with the uh, squashes. Now there's winter squash and summer squash, and we've had a hard time finding traditional summer squashes that we might have grown here. Um, so we've just been using some um, open pollinated heirloom uh, varieties of squash that we can find from like Seed Savers Exchange or, or something like that. As far as the winter squash, um, we're really focusing on a squash, a variety that we call Gete Akosamin. Um, that just means it's a really old squash. It's a, a banana variety. It's really large. It can get to like, you know, three feet long, and it's just really a, a delicious squash. And um, we've just been growing out that one variety. I have been focusing on helping folks just grow out that one variety of winter squash at this point in time. I'm really careful about, because we don't want to cross and, you know, get some strange um, varieties in there, um, the folks that I have growing out the Gate of Kosamin, I ask them to only grow the one variety. And then other people around the area, like, you know, who doesn't like your acorn squash and, and some of those, so um, butternut and all those good kinds of squashes. So we can do some exchanges, um, but I really ask the people that are growing out the, um, the varieties of corn and squash and beans that we're working with to be very careful to not get any cross-pollination so we can keep these um, seeds pure because they were kept pure for us for a long time. Um, my nephew, I'll tell you a funny story. Um, I'm really adamant that we not grow this other squash around the Gate of Kosamin, but he really likes butternut squash and he's 24 and he does a lot of the garden work and he came up from behind the barn um, on our property and he had a couple of five gallon buckets and they were just heaping with um, butternut squash. And I was like, hey, where'd you get that? And he said, well, you know, don't get mad, it's too late. He said, but I really like butternut squash. So, you know, I planted these two weeks later than you planted your squash. And, you know, he's really thinking about the time that the flowers open up and the time that they pollinate, that there wasn't going to be any crossover because he was doing it right. He, he planted a, at a different time and he planted very far away from my old squash. So um, there wasn't a whole lot I could say about it at that time. He, he had a bunch of butternut squash and after I had a few of those, I was pretty happy that he had done that. So along with that, we've tried to just really encourage people to, to use these foods. Sometimes they don't know how to cook with them. So this is just a picture of a, a squash, squash cook-off that we had. We just invited people. We provided squash if they needed it. And we asked them to, you know, make their most awesome food creations that we could. Um, we had this big event and invited the community to come and taste the recipes. And then people voted on who had the best recipes and we had some little prizes. Um, once we were done with these cook-offs, we had corn, beans, squash, number of other um, kind of types of cook-offs. Um, then all those were compiled into a recipe book that we had some funding to print and distribute widely for free to give people some resources on, on how to cook with the traditional foods that we were encouraging them to grow. And sometimes we just have classes, and this is some pictures of a, um, we had a squash canning class, and uh, the woman in the uh, left the upper left is my little sister. She is the canner of the family, and she was teaching the class. Um, that beautiful orange looking, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but that beautiful orange looking um, squash laying next to the jars, that is a Gete Kosamin squash. And um, my friend in the middle there is holding up a C is for cookie. <laughs> and then my nephew is, um, is showing people how to pull the seeds out um, and clean them off and save them for the future. 
and everybody that came to our squash cook-off, our squash canning class, went away with canned squash, the knowledge of how to can squash, and if they wanted them seeds from Gatea Kosamin to grow in their garden the following year. <clears throat> Excuse me. I grow a, diff a lot of different varieties of beans. Um, I love beans. I eat a lot of beans. Um, and beans are just so pretty and actually quite easy to grow. You can grow them, uh, several of them, on the same property and not have to worry about them cross-pollinating uh, cross too much. Um, the ones, the lima bean on the right, I just got from my friend Kevin Finney. He's in Potawatomi um, from Michigan, and I think they were called cranberry lima beans. And he's, they're very large. Um, I should have had a, like a penny or something next to them so you could see how large they are. Um, they're an aggressive climber and they get really heavy. So um, when you put them up, you, I'm going to use cattle panels to have them grow on because he said they will pull down a fence just because they are so big and heavy. Um, the one on the right is a, a Swedish brown bean. Um, they're really small and quite tasty. Um, but beans, beans, corn, bean, and squash are all really easy seeds to save. Uh, you don't have to be, uh, you know, real well knowledgeable about seed saving to keep those. You know, for the corn, you take the seeds from the middle after it's dry. Um, the squash, you, you clean them out and wash off the, uh, the slime and put them out on something to dry. And once they're nice and dry, um, you just put them in a, a brown bag or a brown jar, put them someplace that's, you know, not not too hot. You don't want it to get too hot. Uh, and you also don't want them to get too cold. I guess you can freeze them. I've never uh, put my seeds in the freezer to uh, save them. I had someone who tell me that they did and that they germinated, but I don't know about that. I wouldn't do that. I, I, I've read everything that I've read has said that, you know, like a, uh, probably a 45 to 50 degree temperature is a good temperature for seed saving. And that's where I keep mine at. Beans are easy. I let them dry on the vine and then just crack them open and, you know, save the, the bigger, better looking ones um, for growing out and sharing with your friends. I haven't gotten um, too much into um, I did have some heirloom tomatoes, um, Cherokee purples, they were called. Um, now, they're saving seeds from tomatoes is a little bit different. There's a couple of different ways to do that. Um, one way is to uh, to ferment them. So, you, like, you take the juicy part, you know, how all the little seeds have that little gelatin capsule around it, and you put the in some water. A, just a tiny tad bit of water and in a little cup and then you let that sit there for a couple of days and then it's going to get like a almost looks like a well it is it's a mold that grows on the top of it and then you rinse those off um, using a small strainer and uh, after the slime and the mold and everything is washed off through a tiny screen then um, you put those on a napkin and put them to dry uh, I did have a friend who grew her, um, what they did to save theirs is they just uh, squeezed out, you know, the gelatin encapsulated seed onto um, a paper towel and just dried it that way. And then they just put the paper towel with each little seed on it in their little box when they started growing them out in the spring. And I'll be darned if they didn't get some really nice uh, tomatoes. So, um do work a little bit with potatoes, um, but I just threw this up there just to show you all that talking about that diversity of all the different types of potatoes that there are in the world, it's just amazing. And some of them taste so good. A lot of this food tastes really different. We've had um, tomato tasting contests, like who likes which type of tomato best, and you could do the same thing with um, potatoes if you're trying to uh, get people and encouraging them to use heirloom seeds. I think it's really important, critical time to do that. Um, you just have to be really careful about what your neighbor is growing uh, so that you don't get uh, cross-pollination with uh, 
a variety that you don't want growing into your stream. I just think this is a good and healthy way of life. It's good to to share these gifts with our young folks. Um, they're getting further and further away from their connection and relationship with the earth. And I can tell you, I haven't ran into a kid yet that didn't like planting a seed and, and watching it grow and, and eating good food. So that's kind of what my uh, community is up to. Um, as far as seed-saving resources, if you buy this book, the Seed to Seed book, I don't think you'd ever need another book that it has everything in there that you need to know about seed saving. It's, I don't know, I got it online used for like 20 bucks. It's a great resource. And if you're really thinking about getting into seed saving, I would highly encourage you to, um, to purchase this book. And um, yeah, be which, thank you for listening to me. I will take um, a few questions, I guess. If, if people have them, I guess now I got to go to my chat. Or if people want to unmute yeah. their mics and talk, that's cool too. And I, I can see, I can see a couple of the chat questions. Surely I can um, let you know. Uh, Donna had asked what type of wood you used or was was used with the pestle. Um, what was it made from? What type of wood? That's yellow birch. Both the uh, boot noggin itself, the uh, pestle part. I think that's the. The container part that does the crushing and the uh, mortar, the big, the pounding piece, that, that's all yellow birch, all from the same tree. You, you spoke some about preventing cross-pollination, but we also had a, a question um, on how far, if you, if you do want to make sure you're preventing it, how far do you have to plant your corn from other varieties to make sure the seed stays pure? Or is there, is there a ballpark? That you can well, off. you know that the pollen is like 2.5 microns, and if you do the analysis on wind and everything like that, 2.5 microns can easily travel five miles. But I it, guess it, it depends on what type of uh, terrain you're looking at. Like if you have, say, your neighbor a quarter of a mile away is planting a different kind of corn than you, and you've got trees in between you and him. Um, I wouldn't worry too much about that. I would go ahead and plant that. But I guess you have to use your best judgment. I mean, if, you're, if your neighbor's right there and he's got some kind of variety and, and you, you know, there's no trees or anything blocking the way, um, just keep in mind that, that that pollen can travel five miles. Um, but take a look at your train and see what might be blocking or, or stopping some of that. If, if you have time for another one, Mary asks, where can you find some of the seeds you've been talking about? Um, I would go, uh, you know, Seed Savers Exchange is, is a really great place to do business. They're, they're down in Decorah, Iowa. If you ever get a chance to actually visit their facility, um, I, I would do that. It's, it's a great facility and they do tours there. They also have like seed saving events in the fall. So you can go there and learn more about it. But I think I think that you have to, I think you can just buy straight offline. But they also have, if you become some kind of member, I think it costs like 35 bucks, then they print this big, um, like a, so it looks, looks like a telephone book. And it's all the people around the, that are members of uh, Seed Savers Exchange. And they have varieties that are available in there that are not available in the store. So if you're really getting into it and you're looking for something really rare, um, it might be worth getting a membership with Seed Savers Exchange because you get that, that catalog of seed savers from, I guess, around the world. I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's just in the nation. But, um, you know, then you can write to people, talk to people, learn more. Um, just Google around a little bit, uh, open pollen, heritage seeds, and I'm sure you'll find lots of other sources um, up for sale on the internet as well. But that's where I would probably start. We, we know you have to get going due to the weather, um, so I want to be respectful of that. Do you have time for one or two more? And if not, sure. we can also... Oh, okay. Erica asks um, where it might be possible to get seeds for Bear Island Flint. Did seed savers have... 
Um, I don't think they do. The Baron and Flint is really hard to find. Um, I actually, maybe if you belong to the Seed Savers Exchange and then you get that catalog, I'm sure there may be people in there that have Baron and Flint, but it's really hard to get your hands on it. And I don't have enough to share right now, but um, yeah, it's it's a tough one, but it, it's a great corn. It's it's an awesome corn. Nice. Star asks, um, uh, she's growing several different types of cucumbers, melons, watermelons, squashes in a couple of gardens this season, and I'm really interested in seed saving. Which of these types of um, veggies are okay to um, are okay next to each other and which would need more space? I think you have to, what did you, you want to name them off again? Uh, cucumbers, melons, watermelons, squashes, gourds. I think, yep, I think that covers it, yeah. Well, you, well, you got to be careful with your squash and your gourds um, and your, your melons. You're going to have to, um, I would really invest in the book if you want to grow all that because your melons will cross. So you got to pick what kind of melon you want to grow and maybe just focus on, you know, one melon this year. And if you if you want to grow gourds and squash, um maybe you know what I you know what I did one time? I asked a friend because I did have some pink lady that I corn that I wanted to grow out and um, so I asked my friend who has like 600 acres, you know, could, hey, would you plant this corn for me? He was actually kind of excited about it and did plant it for me. So maybe if you have a friend or your mom or an auntie or someone where you want to grow gourds or could grow gourds, but I, I wouldn't grow them together. I would be worried about that. And then if you want to, you know, there's, if you get that book, it'll also tell you, you know, like for awesome, trying to grow out the Bear Island Flint, if you want to get that diversity in your I should have at least 100 seeds planted. Um, you should have at least, you know, like um, 25 to 30 of the squashes. And the beans, I think, was 25 plants. So when you get that book, it's going to tell you, like, when to plant, you know, the distances that you need, how many you need to get good diversity, and, you know, how to keep those seeds so that you, you get nice, healthy plants all the time. And the other thing, and I, and I really do how to get going, but the other thing I want to mention, and maybe you should uh, do a, a webinar on this, is, is the pollination. You know, getting the pollinators into your, into your area, the more little pollinators that you have, and I'm not saying it has to be honeybees, mm -hmm. because we have about, I think, at least, a hundred varieties of bees in Minnesota. I think we have 400 varieties of bees and like 40 of them are bumblebees or something like that. But you know, ants, all kinds of pollinators, um, the more you have and the more variety of pollinators you have, the better um, pollination you'll get on your plants. I just uh, uh, visited with a guy, he's into pollinators and attracting pollinators. And he, you know, when you see your raspberries and you've got just a couple of little droops on there, it's not quite filled out. He said that's because we don't have good pollination from pollinators and a diversity of pollinators. So the more types of pollinators that you have visiting your plants, the healthier and more nutritious your food's going to be. So that's probably what I got to end on is don't forget the pollinators. <laughs> good, good, strong point to end on. Shirley, thank you so much. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure if you can see the chat, but there's a lot of thank yous. I think um, this is information people were really interested to hear. Appreciate